There were many wonderful films released in 1955, and today I'm going to give you my five favorite movies of that year. None of these films won awards or were the top grossing movies of that year, but they are very enjoyable and highly rewatchable to me. Maybe some of these will be a favorite of yours as well. So let's jump into it. My first movie at number five is Wichita, a traditional western directed by Jacques Tourneur that stars Joe McCrae as the legendary lawman White Earp. The story begins when White Earp rides into the thriving boom town of Wichita, Kansas with a pocket full of cash from hunting buffalo with the goal of opening a legitimate business. After Earp breaks up a bank robbery attempt, the mayor and other town leaders try to offer him the job of marshal. Wyatt turns it down, but reconsiders after a ruckus with some liquored up cowboys ends in tragedy for a town resident and he takes the job. Earp then arrests the Texas cowboys who were there to sell their herd, which angers the local businessmen because they will lose money. Wyatt then bans guns in town and tells the mayor, if you don't like it, fire me. Jip, Al, and other cowboys are sent by the Texas ranch owner to take out Wyatt, but he turns the table on them after they kill the wrong person. So Earp and his brothers, along with Bat Masterson, clean up the town and make it respectable. Tourneur's directing job is impeccable, showing he is comfortable moving between all genres of films from horror to film noir as well as westerns. The script is tight and compact with no wasted moments and great action scenes. McCrae's performance as Earp packs a punch and Tourneur uses smart camera angles to capture McCrae's dominating physical size along with his sense of calm among the violence. At first glance, this film seems like a typical by-the-book western. But if you pay close attention, there is a lot more going on under the hood. Tourneur demonstrates how there is a fine line between being a gunfighter and a gunslinging lawman, the biggest difference being mainly the badge. Throughout the film, the script refers to Earp being unable to escape his destiny of being a lawman and how some men will fight their destiny but ultimately choose the right path. Wichita also takes a look at society as a whole, where civic-minded businessmen push for law and order until it disrupts their ability to make money. Tourneur's message seems to be that maybe the best we can hope for is to control crime for a short while. Wichita is a great old-school western that is as thought-provoking as it is entertaining. Anyone who knows me knows my favorite actor is Humphrey Bogart, so I'm very partial to his films. The Desperate Hours is a film noir crime drama produced and directed by the great William Wyler at the top of his game. Starring Bogart as Glenn Griffin, a convict who escapes prison with his brother and another convict who randomly invade a suburban family's home as a hideout. They hold the family hostage, waiting for a friend to bring them money at midnight. The father of the Hilliard family, played by Frederick March, tries to keep his family safe while figuring out a way to escape as the convicts decide to extend their stay. The pressure builds, so will the family or the criminals break first? The story was based on real events in 1952 where a family's home was invaded and they were held hostage. The film boasts top shelf production quality and great acting. Bogart and March's performances are fantastic and memorable, with the two of them playing a cat and mouse game, always trying to one up each other and get the upper hand. Shut up, Mr. Hilliard. Mystery called you. You can't turn this on us. us. I got my guts good and full of you, Mr. Hilliard. Guys like you, smart-eyed, respectable suckers. Griffin is the tough guy and March's Hilliard seems weak. But as the story moves on, the weakness in Griffin emerges and Hilliard becomes more formidable, shifting the balance of power. This movie was Bogart's second to last film as he would die just two years later. His Griffin character was similar to his Duke Mantee role in The Petrified Forest, his first big film break. It seems like his career came around full circle. In the Broadway play that preceded the movie, Paul Newman played Bogart's character, but he was an unknown in movies at the time. The exterior of the Hilliards family house is the same as the last few seasons of the Leave it to Beaver TV show. And even though the interior of the house is large, Wyler still makes it feel stuffy and claustrophobic. A couple of society issues of the 1950s are represented in the Desperate Hours. One thing is that it shows Americans' fear of strangers in the 1950s, mainly due to crime and communism, 
which leads to the second issue. You can feel the undercurrent of the growing Cold War with Russia watching the film, sensing that the American way of life was under threat. Weiler is exceptional at keeping the story tight and focused. It's very intense and every look or action has a meaning. A couple of other side notes. For a nice middle class family, why didn't they have a television? And pesky Ralphie, the 10 year old son, is a typical boy that wants his dad to be a hero and do something. I thought he was good in his role, but I can see how he might grate on some people's nerves. And just a tip, skip the 1991 remake, it's terrible. I've seen this film numerous times, so audiences young and old that like intelligent crime thrillers should look no further than The Desperate Hours. My third favorite film of 1955 is To Catch a Thief, a romantic thriller directed by none other than the master of suspense himself, Alfred Hitchcock. One of Hitch's lighter, breezier films with a touch of comedy, romance with loads of double entendres and sexual innuendos, but it's not as intense and suspenseful as some of his other films. However, he handles the mystery expertly. Cary Grant is John the Cat Roby, a retired cat burglar living on the French Riviera. A rash of jewel heists makes him the police's prime suspect. Roby dodges the police while he pursues the thief to prove his innocence. Aided by an insurance man and a wealthy mother with a beautiful daughter played by Grace Kelly, Roby romances Kelly and uses the trio to set a trap for the cat's imposter. Thief would be the last of Hitchcock's three films with Kelly, the other two being Dial M for Murder and Rear Window. Kelly would meet her future husband during filming, Prince Rainier of Monaco, and leave showbiz soon after. Also, this film is Hitchcock's fifth with Cary Grant. To Catch a Thief is a beautiful movie, everything from the actors to the sets, the clothes, and the landscapes. It has a lot of style and flash. The cinematography of the French Riviera is gorgeous, almost like watching a travel ad. Even Hitchcock called it a vacation movie. Grant and Kelly play well off each other and do a great job together, igniting the screen with sizzling chemistry. Hitchcock's flair is evident in three famous scenes. Kelly's mother putting a cigarette out in an egg, Grant and Kelly snuggling with fireworks in the background, one of Hitch's more obvious and blatant sexual innuendos. And of course, the glamorous 18th century costume ball. If one didn't know better, Thief feels like a test run for Hitchcock's 1959 classic North by Northwest, also starring Cary Grant. I often wonder if in some way the combination of To Catch a Thief and North by Northwest could have been a blueprint for the future James Bond movies. Something to ponder. Even though Thief is not known as Hitchcock's finest or most famous film, I still find it highly entertaining. You might say it's Hitchcock light. Coming in at number two is The Man from Laramie, one of my favorite James Stewart westerns. Directed by Anthony Mann, it was the eighth and final film he did with Stewart, with five of them being westerns. Stewart stars as Will Lockhart, an ex-soldier delivering supplies from Laramie to a small town in New Mexico. Will runs afoul of the local cattle baron, who tries to run him out of town. But Lockhart won't budge because he has an alternative reason to be in town and it's personal. Little by little, Will unravels the mystery while dodging attempts on his life and freeing the town from the cattle baron stranglehold. The Man from Laramie also stars Arthur Kennedy, Donald Crisp, and Kathy O'Donnell. The Man from Laramie is a vivid psychological western as well as being a mystery. Shot in Technicolor, it was one of the first westerns filmed in Cinemascope. Man makes brilliant use of the vast landscapes showing how trivial man seems among the brutal and unforgiving wilderness. This movie was as close as man got to making a western version of the Shakespeare play King Lear. Man also displays some familiar western tropes here. A well-meaning stranger, Lockhart, rides into town and quickly realizes he has stumbled into a hornet's nest. You got no cause to shoot me. Shooting's so good for you. What did I do to you? Tell me, what did I do? I got a right to know. Yeah, I guess a man's got a right to know what he's gonna die for. The tyrannical cattle baron, Wagaman, played by Crisp. 
the underdog rancher who is stubborn and refuses to give in. But as the movie progresses, nothing is what it seems and there is more under the surface than meets the eye. Man throws the typical conventions on their head. You'll just have to watch the movie to find out. Man also has a knack for unusual choices for actors in smaller roles. The most obvious is Aline McMahon as the underdog rancher Kate Kennedy. She is a tough and pragmatic old bird. Another example is ever-present Western actor Jack Elam as shyster Chris Bolt, whose small character is written well enough to make you notice. Lockhart Stewart's character is a good man who is consistently being tested by different tough guys sent by Chris Cattle Baron Wagaman. He finally reaches his breaking point and lashes out at his attackers. He is a much more interesting character than what Stewart usually plays. Mann also films the violence very differently than most earlier westerns of that time. Instead of being noble and honorable, he shows how sneaky, dishonorable, and messy fighting can be. It's an interesting twist on westerns for that era. Oh, you scum! One reason the movie fascinates me is because things don't turn out quite what you are led to believe, and it makes it refreshing. It defies your expectations. For instance, will Lockhart get his revenge and the girl Barbara at the end? Maybe, maybe not. The Man from Laramie is, in my humble opinion, Man and Stewart's best western together that turns the genre on its head, but still keeps you riveted and fully entertained. You might even call it an early attempt at a revisionist western that would become widespread in the 60s. My favorite movie of 1955 is also one of America's greatest films. The Night of the Hunter was the only film directed by legendary actor Charles Lawton, who was greatly discouraged by the lack of critical and commercial success when released. Robert Mitchum stars as Reverend Harry Powell, Shelley Winters as Willa Harper, and Lillian Gish as Rachel Harper. Based on the novel of the same name by Davis Grubb, it is based on an actual story of a man who was hanged in West Virginia for the murder of two women and three children. In 1930s West Virginia, Reverend Harry Powell is a serial killer who is a religious zealot that targets promiscuous women. He meets a man in prison who tells him he has hidden $10,000 in stolen money. After getting out of prison, Powell is on a quest to find the loot and searches for his cellmate's wife and children. Lawton's southern gothic film is a strange and frightening story of good and evil. He shot the movie in black and white German expressionist style using bizarre shadows, stylized dialogue, distorted images, surreal sets, and strange camera angles. This unusual method displayed Powell's sinister character, the children's nightmares, and the sweetness of Rachel's character. The style also gives the movie a fairy tale quality. You can imagine Mitchum's character Powell as the big bad wolf, and the scene with the children going down the river has a brother's grim feeling to it. Because of Lawton's choices, Hunter has a certain timelessness and doesn't look as dated. It is a beautiful film that has aged well. The role of Powell might very well be Bitchum's best performance. He is an iconic and unforgettable character with the famous tattoos of love and hate on his knuckles. He is a frightening villain. Two of the most famous scenes in the movie are Reverend Powell telling the young boy the story of his tattoos, the right hand and the left hand. It was with this left hand that old brother Cain struck the blow that laid his brother low. L-O-V-E. You see these fingers, dear hearts, these fingers has veins that run straight to the soul of man. The right hand, friends, the hand of love. Now watch and I'll show you the story of life. And Powell at the top of the stairs calling for the children. It's a scene that has been duplicated in numerous movies. I can hear you whispering, children, so I know you're down there. I can feel myself getting awful mad. One of the most chilling scenes is when the children are escaping down the river with the preacher slowly and methodically following them. It's like something from a nightmare. 
Also, the scene with Lillian and Gish in the rocking chair on the porch protecting the children reminds me of the painting Whistler's Mother but holding a shotgun. What makes The Night of the Hunter so great but hard to classify is that it is a mix of genres, horror, film noir, thriller, humor, and a mystery. I believe one of the reasons it was rejected by critics and audiences upon release is because it was ahead of its time. Over the years, critics and fans have recognized its genius, and The Night of the Hunter has attained its rightful place as one of the greatest American films of all time. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching everybody. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button. Also, if you subscribe, click the little bell icon for notifications. Share your comments below. Hopefully, I've interested you to watch the movies you've never seen before. Until next time.